so welcome to all the family, students, classrooms, science lovers, and more who are joining us virtually to take part in this special event to celebrate the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the very first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through over 40 monthly live, free, interactive broadcasts just like this one. So if you're new to us, thank you so much for joining. If you're an old hand at this, it's so nice to have you back. Now today we are hosting a special discussion with Dr. Sarah Gallagher in partnership with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, better known as NSERC. In the International Day of Women and Girls in Science highlights and recognizes the critical role women and girls play in science and technology communities around the globe. Here in Canada, women have played important roles in helping our country accomplish incredible breakthroughs. The government has been very supportive in creating new opportunities to increase the number of girls uh, in these fields and adding their talents and ideas in pursuits like coding, engineering, and mathematics. Now, we are having two special guests before we dive into our broadcast today, and I wanted to start by highlighting someone from NSERC, who, as I said, is behind this entire exciting broadcast today. So, NSERC is Canada's largest supporter of discovery and innovation and a leading promoter of women in science and engineering. Before we bring on our special guest, we've got a couple today, as I said, and bring on Dr. Gallagher. I'd like to welcome Dr. Danica Guzni, Vice President for Research Grants and Scholarships at NSERC, and invite her to say a few words about the importance of women and girls that we're celebrating today. Danny, welcome in. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. At NSERC, we're so proud to celebrate International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Every day, we see up close the impact women are having on science, engineering, technology, and mathematics in Canada and around the world. Each year, NSERC provides research funding to women who are making incredible discoveries and life-changing breakthroughs. We celebrate the incredible innovations of women like Dr. Hanadi Slayman from McGill University, who was recently awarded one of NSERC's top prizes, the John C. Polanyi Award, for her and her team's breakthrough innovations in medical treatments for major diseases. We also partner with women like NSERC's Chairs for Women in Science and Engineering, who lead programs that help more girls find their future in science and engineering. Today, we're only able to highlight just a handful of the many Canadian women who have made and are making valuable contributions to knowledge with their curiosity, skill, research, and discoveries. But we hope that their achievements will help us celebrate more girls and young women, like those of you tuning in today, who will go on to make the next big breakthroughs that will help our world become a safer, healthier, and better place to live. Here's a short video of just a few of the many Canadian women who have had and are having an important impact on the world of science and technology.
Fantastic. What a great video. Uh, as you can see, Canada has an amazing, rich history of women in research, each with their own special story that started with a passion for science. It was nice for us here at Exploring by the City of Your Pants, too, to note uh, Emily Choi, one of the last features in that video. We've had her on many times in broadcast. And for those of you joining in French in just an hour, you might be very excited to see Lisa Dang live with us coming up for that as well. Now, we are going to join. Be, we are joined by our, our own uh, amazing scientist today, You're going to tell her own story, and that is Dr. Sarah Gallagher. Dr. Gallagher is an astrophysicist and professor of physics and astronomy at Western University in London, Ontario, one of the real hubs for space exploration and research on this planet, much less Canada. Uh, she is also the science advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency. So together, we're going to learn today about Dr. Gallagher's day job and the research she's conducting. So everyone, join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Gallagher. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Yeah, so exciting to be able to hang out and do this amazing program together. So what does an astrophysicist do? You've got this sort of iconic, difficult job. Uh, what does a typical day look like uh, in your field? Well, I, you know, I get up and I have breakfast like everybody else. Um, but uh, but afterwards, when we finally uh, when we finally get to work, uh, what I want to do is I want to share you share with you what 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 the screen looks like because we spend a lot of time in front of our computer and so i have an image right here and uh and this is the screenshots for two of the students that i work with Virja katu and kaylee green and so i asked them both to take screenshots so you can see what their screen looks like and it gives you just a little snapshot a little taste of what they actually spend their time doing so i'm an observer which means i want to know what's going on what does the universe look like and i get that information usually from telescopes um but then that information looks like this it looks like pictures um it's squiggly lines and but these squiggly lines are so rich because they tell us about what things are made of, what distant uh, galaxies, what what's moving around, what things are going on. And but a lot of what we do is we look at these images, we look at this data and we write computer programs and we try to tell figure out what it tells us about the world. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, we'll bring us back up, but we'll help here. Um, so as an astrophysicist and extra galactic astronomer, you study quasars. What on earth are quasars? Please do tell. <laughs> Quasars are like the coolest things, honestly, in the universe from my my personal point of view. So I have another picture to share with you. Um, and so this is two pictures of a quasar because they look different depending on what we're looking at. Now, these are artist pictures because when things are really, really far away, they're really, really tiny. And so we can't get beautiful pictures like this. So this is an artist picture of what we think this system looks like. So what a quasar is, is it is a black hole, something a million to a billion times more massive than our sun in the center of a distant galaxy. But that black hole isn't just hanging out, minding its own business, it's actually growing. So there's gas that's coming in and it's swirling around and it falls into the black hole. But before it falls in, it gives off a huge amount of light and it glows and it can be a thousand times brighter than all the stars in the galaxy. And sometimes that light can actually blow these super fast winds. So the picture on the left is showing the, that wind being just blown out from the center of this growing black hole. And on the right, that picture is taking the wind away so you can actually see the black hole in the center of the galaxy. So that's what a quasar is. Nothing like black hole winds to make you feel alive. Like this is so cool when you get a chance to study yeah. things at the edge of the cosmos. Like it's just so mind blowing to think about and, and what a beautiful image you have here. So I'm curious, are there any specific tools or instruments you use to do your job? Like this sounds like pretty high tech stuff. I'm curious, is there something you use every day? Is there something you get to go to special places to use? What's going on? So uh, there's stuff we use every day and we also get to go to special places. So I have some pictures of just snapshots of the different tools that I've used in my research. So there's a picture of me as a student standing in front of a telescope. Pretty much every astronomer will have pictures of themselves standing in front of telescopes because that's kind of our thing. So there's telescopes on the ground, like the one I'm standing in front of is in Arizona. Um, the one in the upper left corner is on the top of Mauna Kea, as is the one on the right, which is the Gen Gemini Observatory, which is also on top of, the Mo of Mauna Kea. And Canada is a partner in the Gemini Observatory. So those are telescopes on the ground, but we also use telescopes in space. And so the one on the left is the Hubble Space Telescope, which I am sure you have heard of. Um, and the one on the right is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And that was one of the telescopes I used early in my career to study X-rays. And to, to study X-rays from space, you have to get above the atmosphere. And so that's why we use space telescopes for that. And the other two things, uh, SharkNet there and Compute um, Canada, those are, those are big supercomputing clusters. And we need those in order to analyze and interpret all of that beautiful information we get from these telescopes. 
So we've had the Canada France Hawaii telescope live from Mauna Kea on our broadcast before. It's an amazing thing. It's such a special place to do astronomy. If you ever get the chance to visit in your life, it's such a unique, unbelievable place to, to sort of explore the cosmos. Very, very cool. Um, so December 25th, Christmas Day, marked the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope, this, uh, I guess, major astronomy tool that's been in the news all over the place and being deployed over the last uh, month or so, a couple months. As part of your role as the science advisor to the president of the Canadian Space Agency, you've taken part in Canada's role in preparing the telescope for its mission into space. Can you tell us a bit more about the telescope and its mission? Absolutely. This is one of the most exciting things that I got to do as uh, as part of my job as being the science advisor. So this is a picture. This is an artist picture of the James Webb Space Telescope. And it if it looks weird and crazy and complicated, it should because it is. And we have these giant uh, solar shields. That would, that's what those big uh, silver sheets are. They protect the telescope from the sun so it can get nice and cold, which means it can look at very distant, cool things in the universe. It has a big, beautiful mirror. It's six meters across, which is enormous. And this thing is so enormous, it had to be folded up like a piece of origami and put in a tube so it could be launched into space. So I spent my Christmas morning, December 25th, watching this beautiful launch. It went fantastically, perfectly well. And now this telescope is out in space and it's getting ready. The instruments are getting checked out so that we can actually uh, start getting some data, start getting some observations of different things in space. I'd really encourage, uh, well, personally, we've been on the broadcast many times, Natalie Ouellette is the James Webb Space Telescope Outreach Coordinator for Canada. We had her on last week and it was an amazing program, one of the favorite things we've ever done. So if you're really interested in a specific telescope, lots of great resources for that on our page as well. It really is a special, special tool. Now today we're celebrating the International Day for Women and Girls in Science. How did you first become interested in space and was there a moment that made you say, yes, I want to do this for the rest of my life? <laughs> So I think there's lots of moments. There's moments as you go as you go along where you think, oh, maybe that'd be kind of cool. And then, oh, this is definitely what I want to do. And I think for me as a student, when I was in university, I was a physics student. And I really enjoyed physics because I felt like it told us really cool things about how the world works. And then as part of studying to be a physics student, I had an opportunity to study astronomy. And what I thought was so cool about astronomy is that it is so obvious that we know very little about the universe. So we're working really hard to learn lots of things, but there are so many big questions. We do not know what 75% of the universe is made of. That's kind of a big deal. And so for me, that just makes it so exciting because it's so obvious to me that there's a lot of work to do. I am not going to run out of projects and questions. And, and we have these beautiful new telescopes that are coming online that are going to give us more information about the world. So that, for me, that's what's so exciting about astronomy is that our ignorance is just right in our face. And so that means there's tons of work and it's really cool. It's really the golden age of space exploration and discovery. And every time we have the chance to talk to an astronomer, you, you, you all say the same thing. It's just, there's so much going on right now. If you want to get into space exploration and space discovery, it's the best possible time to be a student interested in these fields. Which leads us to our next question. Is there a piece of advice you wish someone had given you when you were starting in your journey into science uh, that you would you know, sort of relay to our, our students watching in today? Yes, I think so. I think there's, I had some misconceptions about what it was like to be a scientist. Um, I. I, and one of the things that I didn't appreciate was actually the community of, of scientists and that I would have lots of friends and lots of people that I just love working with. And I have a picture right here, if you want to pull it up. This is one of my very good friends. Her name's Ann Horchmeyer. That's the two of us as students. We're standing over the dome of a giant radio telescope, um, the Air, uh, what used to be the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. And she is still one of my best friends. And so the fact that there's just this community of people who are all trying to figure out these really hard things, but we, we want to help each other and we want to make it happen. Um, and, and so that's something that I didn't appreciate, that there would be people that would support me, that I would like, that would challenge me, and, and that would be my really good friends. And so that's something that I think is really wonderful about the astronomy community. Fantastic. I love shots like that every time we get a chance to highlight sort of the, the collaborative nature of science and all the friendships that get made in this uh, amazing journey uh, across the world in such a cool field. Uh, we do have our special guest who's going to be joining us in just a second as well. Everything's all worked out today, which is great. Uh, 
you know, one final question I want to ask you before we dive in with that uh, introduction and when we dive in with that Q&A session with all our live classes today, are there some practical steps that you would recommend for girls in elementary or high school that can, they can take today to end up with a sec successful career and a track on in STEM? <laughs> Uh, yes. So I think there's a, so one of the things I, I think has to do with kind of your mindset. I think it's really important that you that you remain curious and that you keep asking questions and that whatever your passion is, whether it's uh, whether it's bees or black holes or whatever it is, that you remain curious about it and you keep asking questions and you ask questions until things make sense to you. And I think that that persistence is another big part of it. So some of it is the is just the practice of mind, being curious, trying to understand how things work, asking questions until it makes sense, and, and then studying the tools that you need. So um, all of the different, uh, you know, pretty much every subject is useful for science, uh, but definitely focusing on your studies is also really helpful. Fantastic. Dr. Gallagher, thank you so much for, for sharing all that today. And I'm really excited to dive in with all our classroom questions in a minute. But I did want to introduce our, our second special guest. I uh, made it in the nick of time. That is the uh, Honorable Francois-Philippe Champagne, the Aunt Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, who's going to help us today. Again, highlight why this is such a special day for girls and women in STEM across the country. So, Minister Champagne, uh, welcome in. Thank you so much well, for us today. Thank you very much, Jesse. Your energy is uh, contagious. You know, I was listening to uh, Dr. Gallagher. Wow. Uh, yes, uh, be curious, ask questions. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to be with you all today. Uh, so happy to, to celebrate uh, the contributions of girls and women in STEM. And you were hearing from one of our great, uh, our great scientists, which is the science advisor to the space agency. And I think what she was saying is, is really touching my heart and probably all of you is to say, keep asking questions until it makes sense to you. And whether it's bees to black holes, I love it. Uh, I would have a few other questions for you, doctor. Uh, but it's, it's something like if you ever wondered why the sky is blue, or if you're wondering how does your heart keeps you alive, or even more day to day, how is your tablet or even iPhone uh, allow you to keep in touch with your family and friends in another province or country. These are all matters where you can find answer in the STEM field. And you've seen there are many women, and I'm so happy that you have a number of role models today and girls uh, who are telling you that also when they were younger, they had big ideas and questions just like you have. And they follow their dreams, they follow their curiosity, and now they work in science and, and they're really creating some awesome sciences projects and coming up with exciting innovations. I can tell you, if you've never been, for example, to the Space Agency of Canada, please do so. I think we do virtual tour. and um, You will find a lot of interesting uh, IDs and stuff there. But let me talk also to some of the people uh, that you may know uh, that, are over, that have already uh, demonstrated uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of curiosity, uh, that I've been uh, making sure there's a path forward for all of you. And one of them is coming to mind is Dana Strickland. Um, believe it or not, uh, when she was young as well, she was thinking about laser. And, and I think lasers are pretty cool. And it also uh, she won a Nobel Prize. But what she did with laser, uh, she invented something uh, that we call pulse amplification, ciphered pulse amplification that uses... Uh, that are used now for corrective medicines for eyes. So you see, with a simple idea, uh, she went to win a Nobel Prize, and now uh, she's helping with surgery uh, that is very valuable for people. Uh, there's also, and, and you just uh, uh, had her before, uh, Sarah Gallagher, uh, which uh, I would listen to her all day, by the way, because every time I hear from her, she's always so energetic. Sarah, I miss you. I was say it's so nice to hear from you. I wish I could be here with all day because you're so you're so passionate and, and talking about astrophysics and, and study of black holes. I must say I would have a lot of questions for you still that have not been answered, at least that I can make sense of. Uh, but as the science advisor to the Space Agency of Canada, uh, you see there's a path forward for all of you. And I know we have also students, I think, from the United States. So uh, 
you'll see we're working with NASA as well, and there's some big question in space and and the missions we're going to be doing around uh, uh, the moon and one eventually to Mars. But but the key message to all of you today is that these women and and many others like them have have really uh, held uh, doors open for you uh, so that you can follow in their footsteps. And I would really use them as as inspiration because they're all inspirational. I can tell you as a Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, uh, it, it's kind of a personal mission that I have to ensure that every young girl uh, who wants to pursue a career in STEM uh, has the resources, uh, the confidence, and also very importantly, the support system and the role models to make it happen. Uh, today, we're presenting your role models, but also uh, I can assure you that we want to make it as easy as possible for you uh, to get on the STEM journey. So whether you want to design the next uh, popular video game, uh, discover uh, a life-saving cure, or be a champion uh, for climate change, and we need all of you to be champions for climate change, or even become an astronaut, uh, know that you can turn your big dreams, uh, your ideas, your passion to reality. And just like the very impressive women uh, that you heard from today and that you will continue to hear from today. So I hope you learned a lot today. Uh, but more importantly, that you have fun because science is fun. Uh, science has demonstrated that we can uh, achieve big things as humanity. And, and I look forward, perhaps one day, uh, to welcome you also at the Canadian Space Agency or in some of our labs and making the next big discovery for humanity. So with that, Jesse, I'll turn over to you. I want to thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's great to be with you and all of you today. And, and sorry for being late, but you know what? I'd rather listen to Dr. Gallagher about black holes because you know what? I still have questions until it makes sense to me, doctor. So hopefully next time we'll spend some time together. Got it. You know what? I mean, we do have a lot of school children today. We're really excited to take their questions. You seem to really want to ask a bunch. If you stick around for 30 minutes at the end, we can make sure you get those questions, okay? Well, listen, if they allow me again, you know, I'll certainly be there. If I'm if I'm allowed to ask questions on black holes, definitely. I still have a few Perfect. questions. My pleasure. I'd be happy to answer them all. Well, thank you thank very you much. So much Mr. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, all of you, all the girls out there. You know, we you're our future. And so uh, I would say seize the moment, be ambitious, think big. Uh, there is a space for you in STEM and we'll do everything we can to make it as easy as possible. So with that, I'll leave you with, with all the, the amazing people online today and I'll see you a bit later for the French version of that in a few minutes. Merci. We, à tantôt. We can't wait. Thank you so, so much. And we'll look for your questions in the YouTube chat bar sneaking in amongst all the <laughs> classrooms today. Um, speaking of which, we've got a bunch of classrooms already sharing questions on YouTube, which is fantastic. I'm going to head to our live groups, our Ottawa grade fives and Miss Link's class in just a minute as well. But I did want to note, uh, Dr. Gallagher, before the podcast, I mentioned your great library behind you and people on YouTube are commenting on it as well. So you have a fantastic <laughs> office that looks very scholarly suiting uh, as befits someone uh, who's doing all sorts of neat work like you are. Bianca wants to ask on YouTube, uh, what types of subjects would you take in school? If you want to become an astronomer, is there something you can take at, at various grade levels? I know when I was a little kid, astronomy sort of came into play, I think, grade 11. Um, before that, maybe in university, what would you be the, the best courses to take? So uh, astronomy is really based on physics. So physics is the science that you really need to have in your background in order to be an astronomer. Uh, but in order to do physics, you also you need math. So math is a crucial tool for that. But I would also say that it's really important that scientists are able to communicate and to be creative. And so the courses that you take that help you write and learn how to speak and share your ideas and also be creative are also really useful. Fantastic. I'm so glad you mentioned that science communication is becoming such a bigger part of what scientists do around the world. And it's so important to have those skills to be able to convey your enthusiasm and passion for it, like we had the chance to see today. Yeah. Miss Link's class, grade five, six is your journey today in Kingston, which is awesome. Come on up, unmute your mic. Uh, while you're unmuting your mic, I'll just say it's been a while since I've been in Kingston. You guys have the best burgers and pizza in all of Canada. And I'm excited to go back as soon as I, I'm sorry, Sarah. Yeah, no, not on the <laughs> No, Kingston's got it covered. Hi, Ms. Link's class. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much. We do have great food here. Um, do you guys have any questions for Dr. Gallagher? Hmm. Yeah, Did you ever get to see the James Webb telescope like up close while it was on the Earth? Like, yeah. 
Great question. So I was not lucky enough to go to one of the NASA centers, but I have seen a segment of the mirror. So uh, one of the um, one of the blanks of the mirror. So I've seen them. And it's quite impressive. When you see that artist picture, you can't really appreciate how big it is. And so it's really helpful to see it next to a person because we know how big people are. But I was not lucky enough to see it in the NASA centers before it was launched. Okay. I have a picture, though, actually, of... Um, I can share of the Canadian instruments. Ooh. And so this was uh, contributed by the Canadian Space Agency. And our two contributions, our two instruments are in that module. And so you can see how big that is compared to the people there. And that's just one little piece that is in the bottom of the telescope. Those are the two instruments that we contributed. Fantastic. Very, very cool. The, again, the mirror is such a, uh, I guess, awesome looking thing. It's such a unique thing that never go, went into space. Um, so it, it tends to draw a lot of cool attention. But again, highlighting the Canadian instruments is awesome. We really do produce a lot of um, incredible robotics and things that contribute to space missions around the globe. So very, very cool. Ottawa grade fives, unmute your mic, come on in. In fact, all our teachers, keep your mics unmuted, makes it way easier and we won't hear you until I bring you right in. But hey, grade fives, you're good. You're on the camera. There you go. You were on camera, but we hear you anyway. You hello, hello. <laughs> Hi. We're virtual. So my students are like, there's 60 of us and we're, they're out there virtual, but we do, we do have a couple questions for you. Um, let me see if I can unmute these guys. Yep. Yeah, they can, I think they can, can uh, always happens when people are sharing their screen, your kids can't hear you when you're talking to us. And then they like, hey, exactly. So they're exactly. they're saying you. you're muted. You're muted. They can hear me. Um, so we have a question. Um, Kevin, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Uh, my question is how do you know, like the mass of a black hole? That is a fabulous question. So you have probably heard that you cannot see black holes. So the, what makes them black holes is that light can't even escape them. And that's how we get most of our information about the universe. But we can see the stuff around a black hole. So the way we measure the mass of a black hole, one of the easiest ways is you watch stuff move around it. And just like we could figure out the mass of the Earth by watching how it orbits the sun, and, uh, and based on how quickly it moves around the sun um, and where it is, we can figure out what its mass is. It's the same thing with a black hole. You watch the stuff moving around it. So if it's a little black hole, it might have a companion star and you watch how fast that moves around the star and that allows you to measure the mass of the black hole. And for the big black holes, the quasars that I study, uh, they don't have other stars around them, but they have gas that's swirling around and that gas glows. And so we can measure how fast it's moving and then figure out how massive the black hole is. Very, I mean, it's so, it's very cool. It's almost unfathomable to think about something on that level of scale. And by the way, we started down the black hole train, which means that literally like every time a black hole gets mentioned, the YouTube comments become a black hole of black hole questions. It's just constant. So you make your own bed on that front. Um, but let's take a few from YouTube and then we're gonna head back to our live classes for some more. Great questions, all sorts of questions coming in. Uh, Kevin LaPointe wants to know, what do astronomers expect to discover from the James Webb Space Telescope that is currently unknown? Why send it out? Wow. Yeah, well, you know, we don't know yet. So one of the really cool things, every time you put launch a new telescope, it's sort of new eyes on the sky. And James Webb is so much more sensitive than the telescopes that have come before that it's definitely going to be able to find things and learn things that we didn't expect. And you know what? Honestly, I can't tell you what it is because we don't know yet. Every time we get this new set of eyes on the sky, we learn something new about the universe that we didn't really expect. Black holes weren't expected. Uh, we've seen uh, with some of the other observatories, we've seen black holes that crash into each other and they were bigger than people expected. So pretty much every time we have this opportunity, we find something new and, new and exciting and unexpected. So I can't actually tell you. I'm not sure. We'll, we'll find out in a few months. The first ones are first new results are going to start coming in. It's so exciting. I must say, as someone who's been following this mission for like a decade and having scientists come on talking about it, like it was so relieving and also terrifying when it launched and you're like, okay, it's going to go well. And you hear all the updates and the fact that it's gone so smoothly is amazing. We're really excited to start getting that data really soon. So I'm glad we got a question on the web telescope. That's awesome. All right. Janelle wants to know, what is your favorite thing you learn in your job, even if it doesn't seem really important to others? So is there something that like, I don't know, you, you pick up on every day and you're just like, your mind is blown, but maybe someone that is not your field wouldn't find necessarily as, you know, gobsmacking wow. <laughs> uh, yes. So I mentioned earlier that I study the winds from supermassive black holes. So you have this 
this disc of stuff that's swirling around and it's glowing and it's giving off a huge amount of light before it falls into the black hole. And that light is so powerful that it can launch these really, really, really fast winds. And we're learning more and more and more about these really fast winds. And we're finding out that there's actually a lot of stuff in there. They're really energetic and they have a lot of stuff. And that's something that we didn't know about. That that's a new result, and it's not it's not just me. It's lots of people working together trying to figure that, figure this out. But what we think happens now is that as those black holes are growing, they're in the centers of these big galaxies. We live in a galaxy, the Milky Way, and uh, and that those black holes actually might be blowing out the material from their galaxies or or impacting their galaxies. So even though the black hole itself is quite small compared to the big galaxy, it can have a really big impact on it, which I think is quite exciting and and was really unexpected and and is a new result that's that's come out since I was a student. Sure, cool. That's the thing about science too, which is so cool is that I mean, I guess every generation sort of thinks, oh yeah, so much has been discovered. We are learning so many new things now. I mean, in the last two years alone, we've had, again, black holes colliding, capturing that, detecting gravity waves for the first time. And that's just, you know, in the sort of field of, of large scale astrophysics. It's just an incredible time to be interested in science and technology in the world. Very, very cool. All right, we're heading back to our live groups and I'll take a few more from YouTube. Uh, we're ripping through these guys, this is great. Miss Link's class, come on in, unmute your mic. Uh, Ottawa grade fives, unmute your mic too. Keep those mics unmuted. It'll make it easier for us all. There we go. I okay, got we have one more question back here. Do you want to ask it? Um, what would happen if a spaceship went into a black hole? It's inevitable. I love this question. <laughs> yes. So I I don't recommend it. It's not it's not a good idea. So it kind of depends what kind of black hole it is, which is sort of interesting. So the black holes I've been talking about are really, really, really big. So, uh, but it's more dramatic if you had a spaceship falling into a much smaller black hole, because what happens is as that spaceship gets close to the black hole, you have the front end of the spaceship, if it's headed right towards it and the back end and the gravity at the front is a lot stronger than the gravity at the back. So that spaceship actually would get stretched out and people call that spaghettification. I know, right? It's it's one of those astronomers, we have a lot of embarrassing words and that's definitely one of them. Uh, so, so it's not a good idea. But for a really big black hole, what happens is if you had that spaceship, the difference for a really big black hole between the gravity in the front of it and the gravity in the back of the spaceship as it's falling into the black hole, as it crosses that boundary where we can't see it anymore, uh, what's called the event horizon, uh, if you were on that spaceship, you wouldn't even notice. You would just cross that boundary. But everybody outside, you would just go away. They wouldn't be able to see you anymore. So uh, so that's that's less traumatic, uh, but still not recommended because you're gone. We, we wouldn't be able to see you anymore. We like to throw in the phrase less traumatic in every one of our broadcasts. So thank you very <laughs> much for that. Um, all in all, let's head back to you guys. For uh, I've already seen this in the chat, but we're going to take it live. Another black hole question. Very excited. Perfect. We have uh, we have that. We'll keep that one in the chat. There, I have Maxime. You have a question you want to ask, Dr. Yeah, Gallagher? Do. How does a black hole form, and what happens if a human goes in a black hole? So how does a black hole form? So we know how some black holes form, but we're not sure how all of them form. So the way that, that we know about black holes forming is if you have a really big star, so much bigger than our sun, our sun will never turn into a black hole. But if you have a really big star, at the end of its lifetime, it's going to explode. And in the center of it, if the star is massive enough, it's going to leave a core which is really, really, really dense. And if it's dense enough, that core will collapse all the way down into a black hole. And so that's how we form black holes that are, say, 10 times the mass of our sun. The supermassive black holes that I study in the centers of distant galaxies may have formed from, the, from a big massive star, but it would have that exploded and, and left a cinder, which was a black hole. But it would have been, it would have had to happen in the really, really early universe, much, much longer ago. And then over time, that black hole will merge with other black holes, which will make it get bigger. And it will also, um, gas will fall into it and that will make it bigger too. And it'll grow over time. And so that's, that's another way to form a black hole. And it's also possible that in the very, very, very beginning of the universe, that black holes just formed um, out of space time and that there were some black holes, we call them primordial because they were formed very, very early in the universe. And, but we don't know, those may not have existed, but 
they may not exist, but but maybe they do. And then uh, there are certainly people who are going to be looking for them. But that's the other way they might form. It's uh, again falling down the black hole rabbit hole. Uh, say that five times fast. Now I'm curious about something. One thing that we get a lot of when we get on black holes is like that they're like magical vacuums. They're sucking things from across the cosmos toward them. That's incorrect, is it not? That they're not. They don't have like a enhanced sucking power all of a sudden. Enhanced gravity. They're very dense. They're very. They have a lot of gravity associated with them because they're huge you know, mass of objects, but they're not reaching across the cosmos. We're not being sucked in by some black hole that's across the universe right now, are we? No, no, no. You don't have to worry about that. So black holes are uh, have a really, really dramatic effect on things that are quite close to them. But if you're far enough away, you don't even know that something's a black hole. So there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy, in the center of our Milky Way. It's four million times the mass of our sun, but it's really far away. And the sun doesn't care. The sun doesn't even notice that there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. If our sun tomorrow turned into a black hole, it would be cold and dark, which would be terrible. But the Earth's orbit would just continue. The Earth would keep going around. So it's only when you're really close to a black hole that it has those dramatic effects where it stretches things out and rips them apart and causes gas to glow um, with tons and tons of light. Yeah, I'm so glad you highlighted that. If we just switched the sun out with a black hole, it was literally a question we just got as you were saying it, so that was fantastic. Uh, great timing. We're going to come back to our live classes in just a second as well. I want to take a couple more from YouTube. Uh, and geez, time flies and you're having fun, folks. So four more questions or so. Um, Kitty's joining us in Campbell River, BC. I know people in Campbell River, BC. It's such a lovely place. Uh, let's see, a couple questions from Kitty today. Is there any type of radiation you only find around black holes, like something special? You've talked about these incredible winds that are blasting off. Like, what's going on with that? Is there anything unique to black holes? Well, there's all the different types of radiation. There's you, there's different things in the universe that give them off, uh, that give off that different kinds of light. But black holes give off lots of X-rays compared to other kinds of objects. So if you're looking at a galaxy and that galaxy is giving off lots of X-rays, you know there's a supermassive black hole in the center of it. So there's certain types of light that are more commonly found uh, from black holes than from other types of objects, but there's nothing that's only ever found uh, from a black hole because there's all sorts of uh, energetic, exciting things happen in the universe. So we have stars that explode and supernovae and they give off all sorts of crazy bright radiation and cosmic rays and gamma rays. And uh, But the, the, the different types of light and how you the relative strengths of different kinds of light that's really what's unique to black holes fantastic all right one more from youtube and then we'll head back to Ms. link's class uh mr Sorensen's class want to know how many black holes form in a year one two ten, <laughs> do you know are, are you I, the person I, do, I don't know offhand but i can tell you that in our milky way galaxy there's about one star on average that's formed every year so that's the the rate of star of stars being formed in our uh in our milky way galaxy and we live in a big galaxy but it's not really actively making stars so that's that's kind of low. That's a very modest amount of star formation. But very few stars are massive enough to wind up becoming a black hole. So you'd have to wait a really long time before you're going to form a star that's massive enough that it might actually wind up forming a black hole. So in our Milky Way galaxy, I it's much, much, much less than one per year. And you'd have to wait quite a while before you'd be able to form a star that could eventually turn into a black hole. Okay, well, speaking of stars being born, I encourage everyone to look this up when they're done the broadcast. You've all seen it, I guarantee. But the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation, I encourage everyone to check this out if you want to see like baby stars being born, a stellar nursery of all this gas coming together. It's a really, really cool image, an iconic image of space, and just a, a beautiful way of representing some of this stuff in uh, a fantastic shot. Miss Link's class, come on in, unmute your mic, and uh, take us away, guys. Hey. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I think it was Hannah, do you want to or Jacob? Uh, we have the same question. Okay, go ahead. Um, is it possible for a planet to survive a black hole? Uh, so is it possible for a planet to survive a black hole? So there's there's different different ways of answering that question. So it is possible for a star to turn into a black hole, and then afterwards it can still have planets around it. But it, what do you, if you're talking about survive, 
that that planet is going to be pretty fried by the experience of be orbiting a star that ha that goes through a supernova. So if there were life on that planet, for example, for example, that's uh, it's hard to imagine how it could survive. But the planet itself could survive, and there have been planets that have been found around neutron stars, which are which are massive stars that explode and leave a cinder. They're not quite massive enough to wind up with a black hole, but they're still really extreme. And we know, so we do know that planets can survive that uh, that kind of a, an amazing explosion. Mm -hmm. But if you had a planet that fell into a black hole that crossed the event horizon, it would definitely get get <laughs> torn apart. So I've only seen this in fiction once where you have a planet around a black hole and that's interstellar. A lot of our students will be a little too young to see that today, but that's an example. We've, we've had some questions about time dilation and weird things. So if you want to see that done in a, a really interesting physics context, a star around a black hole, it has been done. You can see it on film, so to speak. Um, let's head to our Ottawa grade five for one final question before we wrap up, everybody. Uh, come on in. Perfect. Okay, thank you. We have Natalie with a question. My question is, can the sun be sucked in a black hole? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Yeah, can, it, can the sun be sucked in a black hole? We are on the question. Is there, oh, is the there a difference sucked. between things being sucked into a black hole? We've had people and ships and planets and now a sun. We're going up in scale, which is exciting. Yes, so so stars can can be, uh, can be orbit black holes. So we, we know in our Milky Way galaxies, there's examples where you have stars that are orbiting black holes. And we've also seen around other galaxies that have supermassive black holes in the centers of them that sometimes stars get too close and they can get shredded. Um, but our sun is safe. So I don't want anybody to worry about it. There are no nearby black holes that we have to worry about. We're very far away from the big black hole in the center of our galaxy. So our sun is good. I'm so relieved to hear that. I was really, I was starting to look out my window, the building shaking a little, it's just the wind. It's not a black hole. We're good. It's all safe. Yeah. Sarah, this has been so, so much fun. I, I do want to encourage everyone to keep the learning going after they've done this broadcast. Time flies and you're having fun, so we are nearing the very end. But again, if people want to learn more about your work or check you out on social media, there's your show, your Twitter ha uh, tag or Twitter name, so if people want to check it out, SCG Quasar. If you want to learn more about NSERC, the amazing organization behind these broadcasts today, highlighting the International Day for Women and Girls in STEM, head to their website, head to their Twitter page there, all sorts of great stuff. And of course, as Minister Champagne so kindly pointed out, we have an amazing space agency in Canada. A lot of classes aren't really aware of stuff that the space agency is up to, and they do such incredible work, both in space exploration, discovery, robotics, all sorts of amazing things. Check out their page there uh, for some really, really neat stuff. And I must say, just as a plug, a shameless plug while I'm here, the thing that really got me into space when I was a little kid, it was the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image. So if every of you get a chance to do this at the end of this broadcast and see this sort of picture of the cosmos writ large, I really encourage you to check it out. It's our last big epic telescope. Dr. Gallagher talked about Hubble earlier today, and it's such a special tool that we use to explore the universe. Sarah, is there any last message that you want to share with all our kids today joining us from across Canada, the US and beyond uh, about I don't know, the space, the universe, your role in it, how people get involved in science, no pressure at all. <laughs> yeah, I would just like to say I feel so lucky that I am able to participate in this, that I'm able to be an astronomer and I'm able to work with students and I'm able to work at the space agency and that we have this fantastic support for all of the activities that we do. And it's so exciting. And there's there's opportunities across the country and and it's it's just a really I feel really lucky so I'm I'm very grateful well, we are so thrilled to have you. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Dr. Gallagher. And again, I hope all our students take the opportunity to learn more about you, your work, the amazing stuff being done in space exploration in Canada, and head to the NSERC website to see how the government is supporting such great efforts to inspire women and girls across the country, coast to coast. Thank you so much. We'll end the broadcast.